Okay, so let's let's get busy changing out some capacitors here. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to be playing a radio show from the CBC. Hopefully, I won't get a copyright problem with this, which I think is coming on right now. And I'll just work away, and we can listen to the radio at the same time. So. Showers ending this morning, mainly cloudy skies, and a 40% chance of showers throughout the rest of the day. A high of eight. This is CBC Radio One, 99.1 in Toronto. I'm Peter Oldring, and I'm Pat Kelly. Okay, and today, we'll do that one first. On this is that. We speak with a Washington couple who is choosing to raise their child speciesless. We really wanted this uh, life force uh, to define itself. It's the Big Apple, or is it? We speak to one man who's confused his fall fruit. I don't think I'm the only one to blame here for not recognizing this sooner because the judges accepted it. The This Is That Quizmaster is back with one of his quiz essential puzzlers. If you get better than 50% of the questions right, you'll win the puzzler mug. And we catch up with former opera legend Robert Poole to see if he can get his golden voice back. We feel a bit of a split, but I am confident that with enough work, we can get his voice back to where it once was. All this and more today on This Is That. Canada, North America's third largest nation, home of pelts. Canada, let's peer into the heart of this great nation, who it is, where it is, and where it's going, and how it's getting there, and who's involved, and what's at stake. Where is it? This is that. In this modern age, the task of raising a child is perhaps the most challenging it has ever been. With so many different schools of thought, young parents may find themselves overwhelmed with conflicting information on which is the best way to nurture a healthy child. Well, one couple in Washington State has taken an unusual approach indeed. For the last three years, the couple has been raising their firstborn child to self-identify as speciesless. To understand exactly what that is and why they have opted to do this, I'm joined on the line by the child's father, Gabriel Roberts, from their home on Orcas Island. Hello, Mr. Gabriel. Hi. Actually, my first name is Gabriel. Oh, sorry. H hello, Gabriel. Hi. So, tell us, uh, for those who have never heard of this concept before, uh, what does it mean to uh, raise your child speciesless? Right. Well... A child is often referred to um, when it's first born as a tabula rusa, um, which of course is Greek for blank slate. And when my partner and I decided that we wanted to uh, create life, we really wanted this uh, life force uh, to define itself. And so that means not pinning a species on this uh, gift of life, but rather um, through its own interaction with the natural world, uh, come to a determination of the type of life it wants to be. Do, do you mind if I ask, does it have a name? Of course. And, and the name is? Echo. So, I want to get into the specifics of how Echo would be discovering what uh -huh. species it thinks it is. Okay. How do you do this? How do you raise a child thinking that it's speciesless? What made the most sense to promise and I um, was to simply spend as much possible time interacting with nature as we could. So fortunately on Orcas Island, um, we live um, surrounded by the bounty of nature. And so that meant from uh, birth onwards, we put Echo out into the natural environment. And it was in the first seven or eight months that we realized there was a real connection going on uh, with Echo uh, and Fox Squirrel. So we fashioned um, like a, a tree den um, that would be similar to where a fox squirrel would live, and that's where Echo spent the first um, six to seven months. So to be clear, would you say that at this stage Echo is self-identifying as a squirrel? Well, no, no, because now Echo's grown beyond that and is, is right now 
uh, seems to be very connected um, to our water gatherer. Okay, well, I would argue, and I think most, including the medical world, would argue that you're... Well, let's, actually, let's debate, not argue. Okay, well, I would debate that your child is a, a human being, and, and, and why do you think it's a problem for it to self-identify as such? I don't, because I don't have a problem with saying that Echo is a human being, if in fact that's what Echo chooses to be. But, and so... But the facts are, scientifically speaking, that uh, it would be a human being, yes? Well, that's, that's your label, that's... That is a label that we're putting out there um, for most, um, you know, life that's born to human parents, and I don't think that's right. Well, finally, Mr. Roberts, say Echo does reveal as wanting to self-identify as a human being, mm -hmm. uh, how would that make you feel? I think I'd be disappointed because, you know, at this point he has the opportunity to be whatever he wants, and if he kind of flakes out and chooses human, well, then this whole time has been a little bit of a waste. But I really believe that that's not what's going to happen. And then, uh, I don't think Echo will always identify with canines, um, but it wouldn't surprise me to see a deeper connection to a bird's life or um, something born of, of air because of his bird sign, or Echo's bird sign. Well, it, it certainly is an interesting approach, and uh, I want to thank you for being on the program, Mr. Roberts. Um, uh, we'll uh, be keenly checking back in with you uh, over time to see uh, how Echo's development is going. Thank you. Yeah, that's not working. We want to know what you think. Should parents allow their children to choose what species they are? Call our talkback line at 1-877-563-2442 or 1-877-JOE-SHE. Canada, full-bodied with hints of maple. This is that. The Bowmanville Apple Festival is arguably the greatest apple festival on the planet. And one of the most popular events of the festival is called the Big Apple Showcase, a competition to determine which presenter has grown the largest apple in Ontario. Well, this year, it seems that the Big Apple Showcase has been marred with controversy. Gord Danforth of Perth County was convinced that he had this year's winner, but was shocked to learn that after winning top prize, he had been disqualified. Earlier today, I spoke with Gord to find out exactly why his Big Apple didn't make the cut. So, Gord, let's begin with the obvious question. Why was your apple disqualified from the competition uh, at the Bowmanville Apple Festival? Yeah, well, it's a question that I uh, regretfully have to answer, uh, you know, doing these interviews. And I'm uh, quite embarrassed to, to tell you why. Uh, but my apple was disqualified from the uh, Big Apple Showcase because uh, it was not, in fact, an apple. Uh, it turns out that my uh, Big Apple was, in fact, a pumpkin. So, I mean, there was nothing uh, suspicious that might have given you a clue earlier on that uh, that this was a pumpkin? It, uh, it would seem... No, no, I mean, you have to have seen this thing up close with your own eyes. It had all the characteristics of a Spartan apple. And I grow both pumpkins and apples on my farm. And somehow, I guess, during the, uh, the harvesting of the pumpkins and apples, they got mixed in together. And uh, as I was going through some of the uh, apples, uh, you know, to, for sale, I came across this, what I thought was a, a large Spartan, and I thought, well, holy moly, I've got a big apple here. I uh, better enter this into the competition. And, 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 I, and I don't think I'm the only one to blame here for not recognizing this sooner, because the judges accepted it. And it went through all of the, the preliminary rounds of judging. Uh, of course, it, it, that doesn't include cutting into the, uh, the apple. Um, so I'm not a, the only one to, to point a finger out here. And, and so it, it was upon uh, cutting into it then that that's how the judges realized it, it was a pumpkin? Well, we all realized it. You know, the second you cut into it, there it is. The pumpkin seeds start pouring out of this thing. And, 
uh, it was embarrassing to say the least and you know it was very very uh, disappointing to see the, the the look of disappointment on everyone's face and to have to stare the mirror in the face and say I didn't do this on purpose yes let Let's talk about that for a moment, because there are obviously some allegations that uh, that this was uh, an attempt on your part to cheat uh, the competition. Well, you know, I, all I can do is uh, ask people to look at my track record. I have entered apples in this competition every year, and not once have I tried to enter a pumpkin. If people had seen this pumpkin before we cut out into it, we, you, you know, you'd be amazed at how much it looked like a Spartan. It was an honest mistake, and I can only apologize for that. Well, it's it's very clear there's a fair bit of emotion uh, in your voice. Well, uh, I, just, I, I love apples, and I love the festival, and, and I'm ashamed and embarrassed that, you know, this had to happen, and, and uh, you know, you fool me once, right? How do you mean? Well, uh, the saying is, fool me once and I'll, then I'll, shame on me. Uh, what? <laughs> no, it's fool me once, shame on you, right? And then if, but if you fool me twice, well then shame on me for falling for it twice. Right. 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 So, shame on us. Okay, well, uh, as far as pumpkins uh, are concerned, would you say that the pumpkin that you entered into the Apple Festival, uh, uh, was it a, 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 a pumpkin worthy of, of being entered in a pumpkin festival? Oh, gosh, no. It's, uh, it's an average-sized pumpkin, you know, size of a beach ball, basically, the kind you'd get for a jack-o'-lantern Halloween. received a lot of feedback for a story that we ran last week about the province of Ontario banning motorists from eating breakfast sandwiches while driving. Here's what you had to say. Yeah, about the breakfast sandwiches. Are you kidding me about the breakfast sandwiches? What's up with the breakfast sandwiches? I'm, I don't quite understand why it's just breakfast sandwiches. Because I think it's even more dangerous to uh, drink out of a can of pop. Hot coffee and hot tea is the most dangerous. I don't think that people can conceive while they're driving. Quite honestly, uh, I think that some people can't even chew gum and drive a car. These laws are simply opening up for more violation of human rights. I cannot believe that Canada can fall for this crap. I do agree. They are totally distracting. I definitely agree with that. It is distracted driving to be eating while driving. Because it's just as distracting as texting. But uh, any breakfast sandwich I find to be quite distracting. I've had it happen to myself that I've lost a bit of control at the wheel. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I, I need to go now and have a breakfast sandwich. Thank you. If you'd like to share your thoughts with us, you can reach us by email at thisisthat at cbc.ca. We're also on Twitter at CBC This Is That. Of course, you can find us on Facebook or you can call us at 1 877 563 2442 or 1 877 Joe Sheep. It's time again to play the This Is That Puzzler. Of course, we are joined in studio by the head puzzle master for the Globe and Mail, Mr. Richard Duncan. Welcome back to This Is That, Richard. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we had several listeners enter online, and we have randomly selected one listener to join us by the telephone and play the puzzler. Sharon Kindler is that lucky winner. She is from Nelson, British Columbia. Sharon, welcome to the program. Hi! Hi, Sharon. Are you ready to play the puzzler? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, fantastic. Now, Richard, I will turn the microphone over to you, and let's play the puzzler. Hello, Sharon. 
Hi, Richard. Okay, so I'll briefly go over the rules. I will be asking you four questions that you have never heard because, of course, I have made these questions up myself. If you get better than 50% of the questions right, you'll win a Puzzler mug and the title Puzzle Master. Oh, great. Great. So if you're ready, I'll begin with question number one. Sharon, I want you to think of a word starting with T. Now drop the T, and phonetically, you'll get a new word. It's a synonym for the first word. What words are these? Twirl and whirl. Yes, that's correct. Very well done, Sharon. That was very quick. Well, thank you very much. Yes, very well done indeed. So we'll move on to question two. Name a well-known movie from the past. Two words, seven letters in total. These seven letters can be rearranged to spell the name of an animal plus the sound it makes. Now, what animal is this? Uh, lamb la bamba. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Well, Sharon, two for two and very, very fast indeed. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, very nice work, Sharon. I'm going to switch gears now and move to geography. Uh, this British Columbia city has a name that is fit for a queen. What is the city that I'm thinking of? Fit for Queen. Yes, Fit for Queen. It's, uh, I, I think I'm thinking of the right one. It's a British Columbia city? Yes, that's correct. City in British Columbia. Well, but, but, but Vancouver was, is a royal, uh, I believe, wasn't it that's, royal? It's not the city that we're looking for. A, a Vancouver was a, a captain, Captain uh, Vancouver. Ah, right, yes. Yes, the ship captain. Um... Kelowna. No, I'm sorry, we're not thinking of Kelowna. Uh, think um, uh, a clue here. I think uh, we're west of Kelowna. Oh, Queen and Nemo. No, I'm afraid that that's not the uh, the name that we're that we're looking for. Uh, maybe this will help, Sharon. Uh, think of a uh, capital city. Mm, mm. This makes it a little bit easier. Campbell River. No, that's not the city that we're looking for. Oh, it, it must be Camelot. No, this British Columbia city has a Queen name Victoria. That is fit Victoria City. For a queen. Duncan. <laughs> Duncan. No, I'm sorry, Sharon. Uh, we're actually looking for the city of Victoria. Oh, yes. Oh, it was not easy, Sharon. Oh, no. Well, it's all right. Uh, we still have uh, one more question. It is again. Uh, a geography-based question. Are you ready, Sharon? Yes. Okay. What is the capital city of Ontario? Ottawa. Yes, that's correct. No, it isn't. Great. Well done, Sharon. <laughs> well, thank you. So that was three correct out of four, which means you're 75 percent. Oh, boy. And for that, we will give you a This Is That Puzzler mug. Well, thank you so much for having me. Congratulations, Sharon. It was a pleasure to play the puzzler with you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> You're listening to This Is That on CBC Radio 1. If you'd like a podcast version of our program, head to cbc.ca slash thisisthat slash podcast. Canada. When it rains, it snows. This is that. If there's one thing that Canadians love, it's the story of a comeback. Peter Oldring has prepared this award-winning documentary about a voice that is bellowing for a second chance. This is Sing Like Everyone Is Watching. In 1998, Canadian Robert Poole was considered to be one of the best opera singers in the world. I met Robert when he was 13 years old, and I was moved to tears when I heard him sing. Plucked from a music program in Saskatoon at the age of 14, many music authorities were quick to suggest that a singer with Robert's natural ability only comes along once every 100 years. The golden voice himself, Mr. Robert Poole! Madame et Monsieur Robert Poole. 
Very quickly, this prairie boy rose to international fame. The opera world had found their star. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very fortunate tonight to have the golden voice himself, the young man, Robert Poole. Robert, thanks for being here. Ah, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Hello, England. Well, tonight you're performing for the Royal Family at the Royal Albert Hall. That must be very exciting. Uh, it's very exciting indeed. What a great honor. And uh, I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't just a little bit nervous. <laughs> well, don't be nervous. You're already being compared to one of the greats of all time. <laughs> so, without <laughs> further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Golden Voice, Robert Poole! Like so many stories about people blessed with greatness, Robert's tale doesn't end on top. Would you like uh, paper or plastic today? Uh, plastic okay. okay. My name is Robert Poole and I'm a cashier here at the uh, Safeway in Saskatoon. Uh, your total is 12 and 5, please. Uh, formerly known as the uh, boy with the golden voice. You know, at that time, my life was a, a whirlwind. It was very exciting. I was traveling the world. I was putting on concerts all over the, all over the planet. Unfortunately, his story would take a tragic turn. Uh, I was home on a break uh, in Saskatoon visiting my brother Don, and uh, it was Christmas time, and so we thought, well, let's go have some fun and, and, and you know, take the weekend and go skiing in the Capel Valley. And I remember it vividly. You know, I was skiing behind Don, and he went off this little jump, and I pulled a spread eagle, and I landed, and my ski came loose, and the binding went right up into my Adam's apple. Completely destroyed my vocal cords. After completely losing his singing voice, Robert admits he went to a dark place. A place where he hoped no one would find him. I went to Tepino in February for two and a half months. And I holed myself up into a cabin and I just thought, you know, this is it. You had your shot, you were put on this planet to do one thing, and now that's gone. And all I did was look at the Pacific Ocean and say, why? Why me? You know? However, there was one person not willing to let Robert give up and be forgotten. We've hit, we've hit a bit of a speed bump. No value on journey, this capacitor. But I am confident that with enough work, patience, and perseverance, we can get Same thing with that one back there. Place. Diane Faulkner is more than just Robert's vocal coach. She's a believer, not only in Robert, but in his voice. So it's it's your belief that, that Robert really can return to being a fully functioning operatic singer. Listen, if, if a baseball player tears a tendon, is his career over? Yes. But, no, I mean, you, you don't say immediately that his career is over. You say, go to physiotherapy, work it out, you know. Not really on a tear. I mean, if it's a full tear, it's, it's over, yeah. Another one. Yeah. I had no, no idea value written on it. Sure you could come back from a tear. Does that change how you feel then about Robert's voice? No. No. And so, with help from Diane, Robert is currently attempting to do what most in the opera world would say is impossible. He's attempting to get his singing voice back. Today is a big day for Robert and Diane because Marcel Moraine, a reporter from Opera Monthly, is visiting. It's Robert's hope that Mr. Moraine will write a feature article about his potential comeback. Oh, so, should I just uh, take a seat sir, and uh, you'll sing something about what's on the plan, sir? Oh, I, I don't think that we're going to have time, or, uh, I mean, I don't think we should be... Oh, I could sing something. Yeah, I'd like to. Oh, 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 sorry, you know, you know it's, really, it's really, really kind of work here. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great idea. Panning for gold takes time. <laughs> uh, he has gold. He has gold. It's, uh, nothing, nothing too fancy, uh... Take your time, boy. Uh... difficult to describe in words the look on Marcel Moraine's face as Robert struggles to find even one note. 
It's as if he's seen a ghost. The ghost of a man who's completely lost his talent. Clearly, Robert is not ready to return. And for the first time, I realize he may never be. Hey, give us a call if, uh, if you get uh, you know, somewhere closer to, uh, to what you think would be more of a uh, stage uh, operatic sound. And when I think about this former virtuoso, I wonder whether it's better to have sung and lost than to have never sung at all. Oh, Perhaps the quality of our singing voices doesn't really matter. What really matters is that we try. For This Is That, I'm Peter Oldtray. It's like point zero zero six. That's what I think that is. Education who says proper texting technique will be part of the elementary school curriculum in 2015. Look, the bottom line is the time has come for us to standardize the use of emojis in our classrooms, and, and we're proud to be the first to do so. I'm Pat Kelly, and I'm Peter Oldring. Remember, Canada, if it's not this, then it must be that. Is that is created, produced, and improvised every week by Peter Oldring and Pat Kelly, with contributions by Lauren Ash, Sandy Jobin Bevans, Gary Anthony Williams, and Chris Redman. This is that was recorded and produced in Vancouver by Chris Kelly. And I'm Gene Sloan. This was that. Okay, so that's something a little different I decided to do with this video because I get a kick out of that show. And I used to listen to the radio a lot when I was working in here before I started videos. And, uh,. I thought you guys might get a kick out of that. So uh, if you found that really disturbing, let me know in your comments. Um, all I'm doing is replacing capacitors here anyway. And uh, I have to admit, I suggested this is that in one of my earlier videos. A couple of you checked it out and you went to the website, something I've never done because I just listened to it on the radio here. And because it's a spoof, everything is spoofed including the web website and the stuff on it. So at a glance, it looks like a serious news website, and that says something about the state of affairs with serious news these days. But um, it's not. Ah, just to be. Nothing serious about any of that. Okay. And hopefully I won't get a copyright hit. I'm, I'm risking a copyright hit, which in which case this whole video will never be seen. <laughs> but again, I'm just replacing capacitors, so I didn't think it was going to be a big loss here. So I'm doing the power line capacitor. And this one is supposed to drain interference signals out of the power line and into the chassis of the radio, if I can put it that way before they travel on into more radio circuits and end up coming out the speaker. And I'm putting on a better capacitor. This is right across the power line, so should it ever fail, it would have to carry the complete power line fault current, which in this circuit would be 15 amps. I have a 15 amp fuse in my house. Yes, I have fuses still. And uh, 
a regular capacitor probably not going to do well with if it shorts out with 15 amps. And now another thing is the way this was covered. Uh, this was done with with uh, tape. And tape's just not going to last, as we all know. So I want to do something else with this. And I'm thinking I'm going to shrink a sleeve onto it. Just get it into the right position. There. Ah, there's friction tape on this. This connection, this is pretty old. This is another fix up of some sort. Wow, right to the power transformer. I wonder what happened here. I think. That's evidence that these capacitors, these, these capacitors have been replaced. Yeah, I think very much. These two tall capacitors, uh, the ones that were squeezed together, they look like they're replacements. So I don't remember hearing any hum in the radio, so I think they might be okay. I don't know if that took. Yeah, that's okay. Put a chunk of shrink plastic on this. Now, because I wasn't saying anything, <laughs> I was trying to indicate to you that you know some of these capacitors come out and they have the size written on them. That's great, but some other ones in here are these auto light capacitors, and all they have is a serial number. I have to go either study the schematic, which is a better way to figure out the value, or I got to look up this number on the internet and determine the value of this this one. That's why I cut it out, looked at it, and then went on to this. So why don't we cover that with a little bit of shrink sleeve? Yeah, I really wonder if when I post this video, I'm going to get get a. Uh, copyright hit. And we'll have to see. treatment here. careful not to heat everything up in the area. That's a lot of heat coming out of that gun. That's why I was moving it around a fair bit. See, everything got warmed up because that's a pretty powerful heat gun. That's good. That's a little better now. So here we go. Oh, cat fight. Gotta go.